So I'll admit, chanterelles are kind of the only mushroom that I'm comfortable foraging for, but I know this is something that you're pretty passionate about, right? Yeah, so in Texas, um, it's one of the mushrooms that I forage a lot, and because it's really easy to identify, it's very abundant, um, a lot of people in Texas don't know that, but also I think my my favorite thing about it is it's very like seasonal in summer, and it's got to be right after a rain, and I remember the first time I found them, it had just rained, and I went out looking and then I found one and smelled it and it was so much moisture in right. that like I could squeeze out and it was like the combination of petrichor and apricots and it was just like it was like love at first sight yeah you love at first smell you're clearly very <laughs> excited about it you also got a cool porcini here which is nice so yeah that was a, a really fun surprise i have never seen a porcini where around the area where i live in texas so it was really fun to learn a little bit more about identifying that that's one of the things i really love about foraging it's like that immersive experience to get an ingredient that is at peak perfection right it's like that moment when you pick something, you're like, Mother Nature could not give you anything better than this. Right. They're also just really fun because they're little surprises. You know, you're in the woods, and so it's, you know, usually it's kind of shaded, and there's a there's a sort of darkness to it, and then you see these little gold things, like, scatter. Right. Yeah, they're like little, like, beams of light, which is like... That's pretty cool. Like. I think the thing about chanterelles, unlike some other mushrooms, which can actually be a little bit better when they're preserved, right. these, the smell of them is just everything. And they are best experienced fresh. Right. Well, exactly. And cooking them can be a little bit tricky. And I've, I've come up with a few ways that I like them throughout the years. And I want to show you a recipe today that is something that it's, it's kind of been a work in progress for like two decades now. I remember the, wow. the original version of this dish, but I, I really like it. And I think it complements these a lot. So, Great. Well, I can't wait to try okay, it. Cool. Let's go inside. We'll get right. started. So, how do you feel about liver? <laughs> Loaded question. That's usually like answered very, one very particular way. Venison liver is a hard one for me. Yeah. I, I try to eat it just to utilize it, but to be honest, I don't really love it. Right. However, I love bird liver. Okay, well, X, all right, good. This is not venison liver, this is duck liver. Every time I think about wild and whole, I, it's like it's easy for uh, all of us at Meat Eater to understand the wild part. Yeah. But like the whole part to me is what's really important. And I was uh -huh. thinking about this idea of utilization of everything, sustainability. Um, what does what does modern sort of sustainable farming practices look like? And so I wanted to show you a dish that uses both wild stuff, obviously the foraged mushrooms, but then also uses some really like wonderful, sustainably farm-raised duck liver as well. And then I again, it's that. the liver because everybody likes duck breast. It's delicious. Uh -huh. like, but these get thrown away a lot and I hate that. And so this is a really fun way to prepare it. And I also think that liver, weirdly enough, is one of the best compliments to mushrooms there is because it's so earthy. It's so minerally that when you get something like a chanterelle, the sweetness of the chanterelle really comes out against something it's this savory. It's a nice savory. compliment to yeah. something that's really rich. To me, a chanterelle, unlike other other mushrooms, it has this like light, lightness quality right. to it that's really special. Right, and so this dish is all about like a really hard juxtaposition. There's something ultra savory, and then something that we're going to try to make sweeter and fresher mm -hmm. than even it is in its in its raw form. So let's let's start with the liver itself. We're going to be making. Okay. I mean, I call it a mousse. It's, we're really stretching that term a little bit. We're not gonna add egg whites to this, but we're gonna make a very light, very fluffy mm. pate, if you will. Would you mind cutting up some shallots for me? Sure. So we're gonna brown these livers off in a pan. We're gonna brown the shallots off. We're gonna brown them in duck fat. And then we're gonna spice it with what people oftentimes call like autumn or fall spices. So cinnamon, some nutmeg, a little bit of cayenne. That's just gonna Ooh, add like kind of a like warming tone. I do too, I love it a lot. And I really like it, again, with liver. Like, mm -hmm. liver is funny. I've played around with the seasonings for years and I've landed on the fact that I like liver best when it's pretty aggressively seasoned and also when you add a lot of fat to it. So I'm just picking some herbs here, thyme, uh, chives, tarragon. We're gonna cook this down so those flavors are gonna be kind of a little bit more muted, but then we're gonna use them again where they're highlighted. 
and then some bay leaves as well. well. Obviously, we'll pull these out, but I think they're really nice in there as well. And probably, let's, let's add three. I, I'm kind of a bay leaf freak too. I think it's delicious. So we got our liver, we have some duck fat, shallots, a little bit of herbs, we got our spices, some salt and pepper. Let's do this, let's grab some of these things and let's go to the stove because we're gonna start there and then we'll okay. bring it all back over here to kind of finish it up. Okay. All right, so the first thing we need to do is brown these livers off, obviously. So I got this duck fat here. I'm gonna use a pretty decent amount of it. The key for me when cooking liver, well, there's several, obviously we talked about seasoning, but the big one to me is not overcooking it. Like, it's gotta stay pink. Yeah. Like, I think that's the biggest mistake people make with pate is they think they're supposed to cook it all the way through. Right, right. We're trying to preserve that kind of rosy pink color to it. Now they're gonna be wet, so just be, I wanna be careful here to not burn myself too bad. I love the smell of duck meat of any form cooking in duck fat. Like that aroma oh, to me is like one so of the savory. most delicious smells in the world. Just a little bit of black pepper in there and then I'm gonna hit them with a touch of salt as well. We're gonna season it a few times through the process. I personally don't like to flip these. I feel like that's how you get oh, them really? cooked. Yeah, I'm just gonna hammer this one side really good. I've never done it only on one side. I've always flipped it. I mean, most of the time you would flip it, but I find that for this, like if you flip it, once it carries over, it's, it's too much. It's not like you're eating it right away. It's right, exactly. Pureed, so you just really need just right. that little extra like depth of flavor for yep. browning. Exactly. That's a good tip. Once we're at that place that we know we're done. And for me, the way I can tell, obviously, aside from the aroma, which is hard to articulate, is really looking for that nice ring of that kind of pale color around the outside. Like this one right here is for sure done. So that can come out. It's like, I know that obviously at Meat Eater, we're pretty much, we're pretty much all wild, you know? Like stuff that you harvest yourself, you know, wild game. But for me, when I think about wild and whole and a lot of the message that we share with people, one of the things we're advocating for is this notion of using everything, you know, and yeah. being responsible in that way. And so if you're gonna buy, for example, like if you're gonna get farm-raised ducks, don't just buy duck breast. Like make sure you're using the legs and the thighs. And in this case, make sure you're using the innards too. Like don't yeah. let that stuff go to waste. It's one of those things that I learned that when I started hunting, that you don't get just the breast or just the legs. You right. get the whole damn animal and you gotta cook with the whole thing. And should I go ahead and add? Yeah, chuck those shallots in there if um, you can. Even though you may not hunt for your meal, you still get to make a conscious decision on what you consume. And I think giving people those options and teaching them how to work with underutilized cuts is really important. Right, and for me, you know, my world's a little bit different because as a professional chef, obviously when I'm cooking for my guests, I'm not cooking truly wild game. You know, I can't in my restaurants. And so yeah. I try to take that extra step that a lot of hunters will spend out harvesting yourself. Like I take that energy and apply it to finding the absolute best producers I can around the country who yeah. are doing the most ethical things with yeah. their animals or, or vegetables even yeah. for that matter. We throw these bay leaves in here. I like to let those kind of yep. blister and blossom in this as well. I think that's, this is something I kind of picked up um, cooking a lot of Creole cuisine is allowing the bay leaves to develop in the fat. And again, if you actually, if you're starting to run low on fat, and we are, we've got a nice bowl of duck fat here so we can just add a little bit more to it. And letting those bay leaves like wake up in that fat makes a huge difference. Will you hand me our spices? This is totally a judgment call thing, but I think that looks pretty good. Nutmeg. This one's tiny. I don't need that much of that. Yeah. Throw How the much rest of those herbs. All of these? All of them. And what we're gonna do is just give these one second to kind of blister in this pan and we're gonna add, start adding our alcohol to this. We have a cocktail. Yeah, I have. <laughs> this is like the Long Island iced tea of pate. So I have a mix of different stuff. I have brandy or cognac here. 
I have uh, red I vermouth, so here. like a sweet vermouth. And then I also, this is kind of the secret one. I have Madeira wine that I have already used to soak um, golden raisin scent. So it's really Ooh. raisiny. So, all right, watch out. This is where it gets real. I just want this liquid to cook down some, but actually to cook a little of that alcohol off of it and tighten up because we don't want to make the, we don't want to make it too runny. Aroma-wise, it smells smell so it. good. Yeah, it's like it's got this kind of wintry, mm. sweet kind of aroma to it, which is just so, so nice. Oh yeah, that's really lovely. All right, so once we get like this, where it starts to look like syrupy to a certain degree, but it's not, it's not completely gone, then I'm gonna grab my plate with my livers, and this is why I don't flip them. We're just gonna pour this hot stuff right over the top of them. Ah. You're not really cooking if the fire alarms don't go off, right? That's right. My mom had that sign in the kitchen of our house as really? a childhood, yeah. <laughs> well, we know it's done because the smoke detector went off. So that's that's, <laughs> that's our, always our sign. Would you mind tossing this in the fridge sure. for me? Sure. This needs about five minutes just we don't want it blazing hot. It, it's not gonna get ice cold, but just cool it down, and then we can mm, go on to the next sounds step. Sounds good. All right, go. awesome. Yeah, these look good. They smell so good. So at this point, it's just, we're blending everything up. interesting to think like, well, when you could eat just liver and onions, why go through the process of making this spread? And I believe very firmly that when you do something like this, you're stretching your meat and you get to share it with other people. You can freeze it for later. And I just think it offers, it lends itself to more versatility. Right. And I just think it's also a little less intimidating, not on the cook's side, but on the diner's side. Because I know lots of people who just they just wouldn't be willing to actually sit there and eat a cut piece, of, eat cut a piece liver. of liver. But they're willing, this is, it's a gateway to liver. You know, this yeah. is like, everybody loves like a really rich That's spread. A yeah, so yeah. this is a good start. All right, so hand me the cream cheese if you don't mind. And just start little, chucking little pellets of cream cheese in here. And as you're watching it, like if it starts to get thick and it looks like it doesn't want to blend, that's when we add a splash of cream. So once we have the cream cheese in there, then we're gonna add some butter. A little bit more cream. Now oh, there we go. All right. I'm gonna give it a taste, see what yes. you think. So it should have like an herbaceousness, a little sweetness. It should also have a tiny bit of bitterness from the vermouth in there, which Ooh. is gonna help contrast the mushrooms really well. That's really good. I can definitely tell there's cream cheese in there because it does add just like the teeniest bit of sweetness to right. it, even tang to it a Exactly, little. well that's it, is that like, I kind of specify that you have to use like Philadelphia brand cream cheese, because it's tangier, but mm. also the cream cheese, and this is to me the really thing that makes it so important is the fact that even when it's ice cold, it's soft. Mm -hmm. And that really improves the texture of this because a lot of pate can get very gritty and almost tough once it cools down. And we want this to still be nice and smooth and spreadable. Look at this, I wanted to show you something here. So anytime you're working with liver, there's loads of like little veins and connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And that's what all this sort of like fibrous looking stuff that's left behind. And it's yeah. just not very nice to eat. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't, the herbs it doesn't taste bad, but yeah. yeah. It's just a nice step. Like if it's you're gonna the take the effort. It's step to yeah. like get that mouth feel that's really right. silky and soft. So flavor wise, cooking wise, this is done, but you can see it's it's really, really soft. So what I think is best is put this in the fridge. Okay. I like it to sit for at least an hour to okay. really like firm up some. So it has a spreadable consistency, but it's not watery. Would you pop this in the fridge for sure. me? Sure. All right, I'm gonna clean up and then we can talk mushrooms. 
All right, finally, the mushrooms. Yeah. That's the, that's the part that we're all here for. Anyhow, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna leave these with you because I know everybody has a way of cleaning mushrooms. Like they have a particular version of this and there's, I don't know that there's a right and a wrong. I think it kind of depends. I think there's a right and wrong. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm I, opinionated. I assumed you would have an opinion on that. So I'm gonna let you clean well, the mushrooms and tell me what you think. I say that mushrooms are like sponges and they can absorb water. There are some people out there who have proven this to be a myth. And if you've ever foraged and picked a mushroom after a rain, you can literally squeeze that mushroom and see the moisture release. So it is holding in moisture, but that moisture kind of prevents it from getting that really nice browning that I like. And so I like my mushrooms to be really dry and I will only wash them under running water if they desperately need it. But these are really clean, so I'm just gonna take a toothbrush and just brush them dry. That's all it needs. Yeah, and I'm just kind of looking through these this porcini right here because you know how it is. It's like, I love porcinis, but this is one of the issues with them is that sometimes you pick them and you get one like this and you just get one that's been decimated and it's not all like that's the one thing I would stress to people is that maybe not the whole mushroom is shot so like in this case I can use some of it some of it is still in, in decent enough shape yeah but not the whole thing yeah and that's the thing about working with wild mushrooms is you don't always get what you want like when you go to a grocery <laughs> store you expect it to be like this perfect thing it's like very um, standardized right. and I love that when you get wild food it's like at what point when you pick this you know, like where is it in its stage of life and like all the other elements that have affected it. And I, I think it makes it more fun, more challenging, and yeah, special. Yeah, exactly. So one of my ingredients that I absolutely love with mushrooms, it really doesn't matter what variety of mushrooms, is celery. You know, when you're talking about all the, the levels of like flavor and texture, one of the things that sometimes is neglected is components that increase the raw of something that bring back that raw bite. Yeah. And that's what celery really is able to do, especially if you don't cook it too long. I think celery is very underrated. I didn't really think much about celery more than like the base of a soup or something. Right. And then I grew it one year in my garden and I was mind blown by how flavorful it could be. Right, and honestly, that's one of the reasons why I like to take the hearts out of kind of bigger store-bought celery. I watch people throw this away more often than not. I like, know. Like they only use the outside tough yeah. green part. And they throw this away when in reality, like it's much more tender and the flavor, the celery flavor in the hearts is like 10 times what it is in the like big giant green stalks. Also, these leaves right here are one of my absolute favorite, and I will use it in this term, like I see them as an herb, and that's what mm. the way I treat them. So I've noticed you've got... Uh, golden raisins. Golden raisins. That's really fun and uh, pretty unique. What are we doing with them? Well, so I think this comes a bit from growing up in the South in that I love Madeira. Like it's one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah, Madeira factors into, it factors into Southern cooking a lot. And to me, the flavor of Madeira is the flavor of, of you know, raisins and, it, and specifically that golden raisin flavor. Mm -hmm. The reason I like it in this dish is that we were saying this earlier that how hard it can be when cooking a chanterelle not to lose the raw flavor of yep. the chanterelle. And it, really the answer is that it's impossible to not lose some of it. But what you can do is kind of replace it with things that strike that same note from a yeah. flavor perspective. That apricot -y flavor will come back in the form right. of these raisins. When you well. add two ingredients that share like similar aromatic pro profiles, you just elevate it together. Exactly, exactly. And I'm gonna get the pan going real quick. So okay. for this, it might sound a little bit crazy, but I don't actually want to roast these really hard because we have the really dark flavor from the liver. And so I'm gonna get some butter really brown, like burn noisette, but then we're just gonna drop the mushrooms in it like and let them sit right okay. here, like undisturbed, and that'll be enough cooking. So. Okay. I also grabbed some shiitakes from a little local producer here because I thought they were pretty. And just yeah. to kind of add some if we want. I like the texture of shiitakes. I just think they, they have such a great texture. And they're a nice contrast too because again, it's more earthy. Yeah, well, and I think that it actually somewhat makes the point to why a chanterelle is unique and different when you taste it alongside other mushrooms. You I know? completely agree, and I think that so many people get very wrapped up in morels. There's this cult following. Yeah. It's People are obsessed with morels, and I honestly think a chanterelle is just so much more special in the fact that it's just got this really special aroma and taste and texture that can't be really replicated. Agreed, like if it's up to me, I would take a chanterelle every day of the week over a morel. I would too, I would too.
Danielle, very hot. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That's another one of my favorite aromas of all time is browned butter. I yeah. love it. All right, so we just add those in there into that hot butter. Not all of them though. We're gonna just, we're gonna cook them in batches here. Like this is gonna oh, be okay. plenty for our first round here. Okay. I wanna, you never wanna like get them too crowded because we still wanna get some color. But what I don't wanna do is like really, really just overcook these. I'm trying to just get them cooked through. So. That's enough for the amount of butter that we have in the pan here, and I'm just gonna let them sit. I am going to add a little bit of salt now, so that if they do have any moisture, it'll go ahead and come out of them. I'm also gonna drop my little celery batons in, and these will just soften just a little bit. I'm also gonna throw some more tarragon in, but I'm not gonna chop it. I don't wanna eat a bunch of tarragon this time since we have it in the pate. So I'm just dropping it add in. Add a little aroma yeah, and exactly. pull it out. So the other thing I like to add now is the golden raisins. I forgot to actually ask you, where did you get these mushrooms? I know you went out yesterday with Hayden, right? Yeah, Hayden and I went foraging uh, in here in Montana, just not too far outside of the, the city of Bozeman. And that's one of the things I actually like about foraging for mushrooms, is that it feels to me like it's, how do I say this? Like it's, a, it's something anybody can do even if you live in a big city, because those mushrooms grow everywhere. And if you live in New York City, there's still gonna be wild mushrooms Absolutely. just outside if you know where to look. And these mushrooms especially are very accessible all throughout the U.S. And I think that's really important for people who may never ever go hunting a day in their lives, but if they want to have a deeper connection to their food, being able to get outside and like reconnect with nature is, is a really great way to do it. And I think it just teaches us a little bit more about the value and importance of the ingredients that we harvest. Exactly. And I think one of the things that's great about mushroom foraging is that it, it feels accessible to everybody regardless of where you are. Yep. There's opportunities like this. And that's it's just totally. really cool that everybody has that right. chance to harvest something that's truly wild. Yeah. So I added some chive sticks to this and some celery leaves as well. I'm also going to add a little bit of lemon zest. And a little piece here to this is just a touch of lemon juice. The colors and the textures are just so pretty. It's it is like so that. pretty. It's like a warm salad. Exactly. All right. Do you want to actually taste this thing? Yes, I okay. do. Would you grab the liver, the pate out of the fridge, and I'm mm -hmm. going to grab some toast and let's assemble it all together here. So pretty. It's nice. It's just a nice little light lunch, like with a salad on the oh, side, like some, totally some greens. this is totally a meal for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And you actually made a comment earlier that I think was really smart. Like this filling could be a ravioli filling. You could cook your ravioli and then drop them into this brown butter, just mm -hmm. like these mushrooms, and that could be a dish. Like, yeah. And that's cooking. That's what's so great about cooking is that you have one vision, I have a different vision. There's, It's not right or wrong. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people at home have this little hurdle, like you're a professional cook, and people think that there's this like right and this wrong way, and there are ways of making things definitely better, but I always try to tell people like, make sure that you're eating something that you're just really going to enjoy and appreciate. Right. To me, that is like my ultimate goal for what I do, um, teaching people how to cook is, is like, I want you to value this food as much as possible. <laughs> Once you start cooking it, it's not mine anymore. It's yours. Yeah. You know? And that's yeah. the great thing about cooking. So yeah. I've said enough. Let's actually taste this. I thing. know. This is so beautiful. Mm. This is very satisfying. Mm hmm. And the pate brings a richness to it, an earthiness, but I don't think it covers up the mushroom flavor at all. I think you very much still get the mushroom flavor on top of it. It's a really nice combination. Yeah, the pate is so rich and flavorful, but you still have that moment where the chanterelle gets to shine. Right. I mean, I think all of this stuff together, especially with the celery, it's like such an unexpected combination. 
Right, exactly. That's what they're there for. Again, because all we want to do here really is prove why the chanterelle or really any foraged mushroom, but especially the chanterelle, is so unique, you know? Mm -hmm. And the easiest way, in my opinion, to do that is to serve it against its counterparts. It really highlights it in a special way, and I think chanterelles, because they are so hyper-seasonal, that this allows us to celebrate something that we might have to wait a whole year yep. again to eat. Exactly, well, I feel very fortunate. Thank you for bringing them. You're welcome. Thank you for showing me some new ways to cook with a mushroom that I really, really love.